the oldest problem that mankind has had from the beginning of time is how do I secure my property from being stolen? And what happens when you fix that problem? What happens when now Bitcoin and I can secure all my property with a cryptographic key I can keep in my head? Bitcoin, it has the potential to be a 500 year system. Uh, 5,000 year system. It might be the first immortal money because it can learn, it gets smarter. But no one can pervert it. No one can corrupt it politically. And that that's the most important part here because that allows society to build on top of this new robust layer that can't be changed. Well, we thought we'd talk about something that would really kind of expand your mind and do exactly what's going on here and, and how it's so much bigger than what a lot of you realize and that we're such at the infancy stage. Each one of you have a massive amount of opportunity in front of you. And so to frame this up, who's been in Bitcoin for more than three years? What about five years? And if you've been in it for more than five years, are you still learning new things all the time? Right? Because it goes so much deeper. And one of the problems that we have, especially for people that are like really smart, is they go, oh, yeah, I get that. I get that. And they quickly dismiss it. Right. But if you have an open mind, and you're inquisitive, you're always learning. You're always discovering these new things. And so part of what uh, Brandon and I want to talk about tonight, framing this up, is that Bitcoin is not just a new technology. It's something much bigger, something much bigger than that. And it's not just a new technology. It's a technological revolution. So what is the difference? So a new technology is something that extends the life cycle of a previous technological revolution. So it might take something like a iPhone, for example, as a new piece of technology. And what it did is it took two pieces of technology, a computer and a phone, and put, I mean, I'm sorry, a computer and a phone, put them together, and it came up with this. And it's cool. But it's not a technological revolution. Technological revolutions are different in two main ways. And one, they change the course of humanity. And two, they drive financial markets, okay? Now, there's only been five in the last about 300 years. There's only been five, all right? And so we'll go through them and then we're gonna chop this up and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of break it down and then we can do some Q&A on this. But to kind of frame this, there's been five. So the first one was in the late 1700s, we had the Industrial Revolution. That's when it all started. About 300 years ago, this whole world was dirt. There was no machines. <laughs> There was no planes. There was no nothing. All right. Everything that we had, almost all the abundance in the world came in the last couple hundred years. And so it started with that. And we had a machine that could do the work of 5,000 men. But what are those 5,000 men going to do? Well, it turns out science, medicine, things like that. About approximately 50 years later, we had steam engines and railways. Instead of horsepower, manpower, now we had machines that could move stuff across continents. It changed the course of humanity. About 50 years later, we had electricity and steel. Now, those are what, they, what those are, those new technological revolutions are new building blocks that allows us to build new things that we didn't have before. So steel allowed us to build skyscrapers before we could build two or three stories. We could build bridges. So it was those things. Um, we had electricity. About 50 years later, we had oil, automobiles, and mass production, 1908. About 50 years later, 60 years later, 1971 was the age of the microprocessor, which brought us telecommunications and the internet and Zoom and the iPhone and TikTok and all that. And we're about 50 years later from that, about 2022, 2023, and there's another technological revolution happening. And that's where we believe Bitcoin fits in. It's not just a new technology, but it's a technological revolution. Now, remember, two things. They change the course of humanity. And two, they drive financial markets. So what have all the financial markets been driven by over the last 50, 60 years? Telecom, internet, computer. Before that, Ford, GM, GE. Before that, oil, steel. See how that works? The other thing is that uh, they're always somewhat predictable in which a new technology or technological revolution has to have a first killer application. How do we use it? So when electricity came out, what was the first killer application, anybody? A light bulb. 
So what is this electricity thing, Brandon? I don't get it. Well, it's sort of like a digital candle, right? Um, and it was that, but it became so much more. And so they have this, uh, this killer application. So Bitcoin today has a killer application, money, and it's changing money. And we believe that it can change the course of humanity through changing incentive structures and drive all financial markets for a long time. So that's how big this is. We're at the beginning of this. And so let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Awesome. Yeah, what's up, guys? Happy to be here. Um, quick commentary on the scale of those technological revolutions. Today in America, the average individual consumes 2,000 calories internally, right? That's our food. Um, but through this advanced technology, we harness about 200,000 calories per person. That's using advanced forms of energy like dense oil and machinery and things like that. So that's a huge exponential curve that we're all harnessing today. And when I think about this, like asking the question, like what can Bitcoin change, right? It's a very hard question to ask because it is a new thing. It's a novel thing. It sort of disrupts all the systems we see. And Mark and I talk a lot about cycles. And I think right now where we are in humanity's cycle is that we look around at our institutions and our institutions are decaying. We do not trust them anymore. And for good reason. Right. The majority of the scaffolding of our of our society today was forged at the end of World War Two uh, or right around there. That's FDIC. That's World Bank. That's uh, NATO, the IMF, unemployment insurance, uh, Bretton Woods, obviously. Right. The list goes on. So those institutions were formed, forged in a previous era. And in that era, you, let's say it made sense. Right. That, that fits the, the needs at the time, the technology at the time. Fast forward 80 years, those institutions have decayed. Um, just through entropy, through uh, corruption, through various different means, technological changes, right? They don't fit the current, the current system. And humans are starting to notice this. We are pushing back on our institutions. Uh, the economic system's not working. The political system's not working. Who do we trust? And right during that crucible of, of change in our species enters this Bitcoin thing, right? This anonymous guy just drops a white paper on a, a pretty much no-name mailing list and <laughs> okay, that, that piece of paper, that piece of code went out and hijacked the minds of millions of people. It bootstrapped itself uh, to a trillion dollars at one point. There's no marketing officer. There's no CEO. There's no master plan, right? Just out pops this thing. And now we get to, to grapple with it. And we start to notice that humans really like this thing. It solves problems for us. And it might even solve some of those enormous institutional problems, right? It for sure solves the problem of savings if you're living in a, in a regime with a crappy currency. It solves payments if you're in a country that can't send money abroad or you have fragmented systems or you don't have an identity or you're per persona non grata in the eyes of your government. Um, it solves energy problems because we have the need to uh, spread cheap, low-cost, high-density energy around the world and Bitcoin helps us bootstrap that. Um, but it just also might help us replace the institutions that our society is built upon. Um, maybe we don't need a central bank run by, you know, a dozen white dudes in a room steering the global economy. Uh, maybe we can push that, that job to an open source protocol that we all contribute to um, that doesn't have the ability to be captured politically um, like all previous monetary systems have done. And if that is true, then we can have a new monetary system, a new trust layer, a new uh, value system for the world that doesn't break every so often because it gets corrupted. And if that's true, that's a new foundation to build. You mentioned steel. Uh, maybe Bitcoin is the, the steel of money, right? Maybe that allows us to build bridges, which makes Manhattan what it is, builds the skyscrapers. And so, yeah, it is that new fundamental particle or building block for a society that's very hard to imagine. Yeah. Um, we just have to speculate on that. You know, you talk about some of these institutions that are uh, ancient and they're still being used in this modern age today. And so if you think about that, like one of the problems that we had is that uh, thousands of years of modern history of using gold and things like that, where commerce was done on a local level. And so it's very easy if I'm holding the gold coin, I'm holding the gold coin. And if I hand it to you, you're holding the gold coin. And, and we had that. But as soon as the world started to expand, really in the 14, 1500s, um, it, we started having this global trade. And then all of a sudden, we're having to trade across borders and across oceans. And settling gold, final settlement, became very difficult. And so we needed a new form of technology 
It's always technology. Thousands of years of history. It's always technologies that change things. And it doesn't just change um, the way we do things. It changes the way that we organize ourselves, the way that we um, organize our, ourselves, where we live, our institutions, etc. And so uh, we need a new piece of technology, and that new technology was called a ledger. And the ledger then would then basically keep track of who had the gold coin. And so he's in one continent, I'm in another, and whoever held that ledger could then say, well, Brandon has the gold or Mark has the gold. The problem is then that introduced trust. And so now we have to trust who's ever holding that ledger. And so for the last, then another couple hundred years go by, um, gold continues to get centralized, gets put into vaults. And, and that's basically where we're still at today. Here we are about 500 years later after that um, ledger has been introduced. And we found that trusting institutions doesn't always work out so well. We found that centralization leads to manipulation. And we found that when we trust central entities with our data or with our money or with whatever, then they tend to violate that trust. And so I like to say that solutions are supposed to come to problems. And so that would create a very big problem. And so then there has to be a new technology or a revolution. So how do we solve that problem? And that's where Bitcoin comes in. It solved the problem of who has the ledger, which of course, nobody has the ledger. Or I should say, we all have the ledger. <laughs> right? That's right. Uh, quick tangent. Uh, a lot of people attack fiat money as if it's this totally evil thing. And you're right, in many different ways, it creates poor outcomes. Um, but I think there's an interesting uh, narrative violation here for Bitcoiners to ingest, and I'll put for it right now, which is that uh, fiat money in the early 1900s solved a technological problem, which is that gold does not work very well globally. Um, settlement is challenging, divisibility is challenging, and it actually didn't support the, the globalizing economy that we were heading towards. And so even though we demonize fiat, it did solve a technological problem at the time because we didn't have a better solution. Um, but what Bitcoin is, it's actually more like gold in the sense that it's a bare instrument. It's more like physical money, but lives in cyberspace. And so Bitcoin essentially has the, the durability and the uh, hardness that gold has, um, but it also has the transportability and divisibility that fiat has. And so we get sort of the best of both worlds. We get credit-like scalability with uh, commodity money-like durability and hardness. Um, and again, it's a technological change to replace a previous technological change. Yeah. And one sort of meta point that I, little, little thing I really like right now, which is that technology is symbiotic with humans. Um, the whole history of humans and technology goes like this. Humans have a problem, we create new technology, that technology solves the problem, and now that actually changed us, that changed society. So we create technology, technology creates us. As we were talking earlier, we ran through a bunch of these examples. One Mark likes is the stirrup, right? The little thing you put your foot into when you're riding a horse. Um, but that allows you to be faster, wear armor, and essentially be the, the knight that we have in our minds right now. And that created a society where you have these knights that builds up the feudal system, right? So one little blacksmith changed that, created the whole feudal system. Now we're in a feudal system. We have new problems. We need new solutions to solve those, right? So it's just a self-reinforcing symbiotic loop for infinity. So we had the gunpowder revolution and now one surf could take out a hundred knights and then we got decentralization. So the pendulum swings from centralization back to decentralization. And then the then we go, so there's a thousand and then the 1500 gunpowder revolution. And then 1780, we got the industrial revolution. We started centralizing seven and then uh, and on and on and on. But let's let's jump forward. I mean, everyone kind of gets the, the digital gold, digital money, Swiss bank account in your pocket. I think you guys already got all those value propositions. We don't need to lay that down. But let's kind of jump back into like this future casting a little bit. So if it's a technological revolution that can change the course of humanity and drive financial markets, um, like we've laid out the examples of before, uh, a couple of things I think about, you know, a lot of times you might hear um, financial analysts, talking heads on TV, whatever you want to call them, talk about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency as an asset class. But what if Bitcoin has every asset class built on top of it? Right? So that's one way. And we don't know. First of all, uh, humans are no good at imagining the future. Brandon and I are not good at it, neither are any of you. And that's the reason why is because all we can do is imagine a better version of what we have today. So if we have cars, we'll have flying cars one day, right? But 
what happens is when we have a new set of building blocks, it allows new things to be built. And then when those new things are built, then we can build new things with those. And so like in the early days of the internet, if any of you guys, I know some of you guys are old enough to remember those early days of the internet, it was like, oh, well, we'll use it for like message boards and like maybe one day we'll buy stuff online, I think. Like that, that's kind of what we thought about in the, in the mid nineties. Um, but we didn't know that our cars would be hooked to something called a cloud using something called social media to navigate us around traffic because we didn't have social media. We didn't have a cloud. We didn't have those building blocks. Right. And so that's, so, so we don't know. Right. So we're just kind of, uh, imagining here, but, uh, as far as the financial markets, it would be easy to see that maybe all the financial markets could be built on Bitcoin, all the assets in Bitcoin and not just it being one asset class. And we'll table that for financial markets, but let's talk about changing the course of humanity. So I'll start, you know, one of the big things I like to think about is uh, Charlie Munger's quote that uh, show me the incentives, I show you the outcomes, right? And so if you think about incentive structures, um, I believe that uh, we should be, uh, I, th I believe business owners are servants. I believe that we're trying to solve problems and serve other people's needs. That's how we get ahead in the life. And I think that um, we should have proper incentive structures to do that. And so what happens is when incentive structures are misaligned, for example, an extreme example would be if I was uh, living in an African country under a bloodthirsty you know, dictator warlord, for example, I would have no incentive structure to allow me to save and to create and to, and to innovate because I know that any time he could come just kill me and steal all my stuff or just steal all my stuff and leave me alive or whatever. And so I'm just basically just kind of living, living – living right and the warlord also has the same incentive structure where he knows he doesn't need to provide any value because anytime he wants he can just come take my stuff so neither of us both me and the warlord are not providing any value to the world neither of us are doing anything of value to humanity neither of us are doing anything to innovate or push things forward because of that incentive structure now if we flip that where all of a sudden i can save in a way that he can't steal from me now all of a sudden I'm incentivized to think long term. Well, shoot, now I can save, now I can build, now I can think long term, now I can innovate, now I can come up with new ways that I can, you know, use my resources more efficiently, etc. And the warlord also goes, well, shoot, since I can't steal from him, I guess I need to come up with a way to provide value to him so he'll give me some of his money. And so that one small shift went from both of us, or I should say neither of us, providing any value into the world to now both of us trying to figure out how we can put maximum value in the world. Just one small shift in the balance of power. And that's one example. We don't know how big that goes. Yeah, just to reduce that down to some simplest form, Bitcoin essentially uh, shifts power away from the political class and, and puts it in the hands of the productive class. Um, and that one base incentive can cascade into all corners of society. Um, I'll talk about another speculation on the future with Bitcoin, and it's relevant now because we watch the money printer go burr. But essentially, we have the uh, capacity as the central reserve currency issuer to print more currency at will. And there might be a case when that makes sense. Uh, the barbarians are at the gate and we need to print some money to defend ourselves. Maybe that's justified. Um, but because we have that magic money printer button, um, we have the capacity to use it and abuse it in times when it doesn't make sense, um, whether through corruption or just due to our, our culture of interventionalism. So we can't let the markets fail because it's election season, you know, push the money printer. And a couple times, no big deal. But what this does over the long term is it distorts the, the signal. The monetary signal throughout the whole economy is wrong. And humans following our incentives allocate capital to the best of our ability. But if the signal has low fidelity, we make poor decisions. Those poor decisions have a cost. That cost is socialized on the people. And in a, in a time where there's a financial crisis and we bail out the banks, for example, okay, short term feels good. Long term, it's hiding the risk. It's slipping the risk under the rug. It's just building a bigger tower with a weaker foundation. And that hidden risk blows up eventually. And because we kept building a higher tower with less structure, it's going to be a bigger explosion, a bigger meltdown. That meltdown causes more consequences. Under a Bitcoin type system, um, you can't push the money printer. My node rejects 21.1 million Bitcoin and as do yours. And so what does that do? It forces some restraint on our, our central institutions and it forces them to uh, 
clear out the companies that don't work. The zombie companies get tossed away, capital recycles, and the system uh, into better allocators. And the system grows and grows and grows and has less magnitude. So my speculation is uh, shortens or essentially lowers the magnitude of the business cycle and the, and the long-term debt cycle. Um, and that's better for everyone. Reduces the risk, or sorry, reduces misallocation, creates more value, and that uh, spills into society. And so, uh, yeah, that's what yeah. I do. Another thing I would think about in, in terms of putting value into the world, right, is that if you think about um, focus, focus is like a superpower. So I can take the sun, it can warm up the whole world, but with a magnifying glass, I could start a fire, right? And we take a river, a meandering river, I'd make a dam, I could light up all of Las Vegas, right? And so you, when you focus things down, you get, you get this superpower. And so if I can take all of my time and all of my focus on trying something, trying to achieve something very high value, curing brain cancer or something, right? Brain tumors, or I don't know, right? And, and I'm just going to be the best brain surgeon I can be, and I'm going to come up with new technologies, and I'm going to come up with new ways to do this, and I'm going to try to save as many lives as I can. I could focus on that. I could probably do really good. But the problem is because our money loses value, I can't just be the best brain surgeon or whatever I want to be. And so now I have to be a half brain surgeon, and I have to be a half investor. I'm forced to be a half investor because if I just make – 1500 bucks an hour being a brain surgeon or 25, I don't even know how much to make, 5,000 bucks an hour, doesn't matter. I put that money in the bank, but it just buys me less and less and less and less and less. And so now I have to be a half investor. Now, if I have a pie, uh, if I have a circle and I have 100% of my focus there, and then I put a line down the middle and I have half investor and half brain surgeon, I have half of my brain power going to that high value task that could do very good for humanity. And then half my brain power has to be spent chasing a bunch of whatever digits so I don't lose my purchasing power. I mean, think about the brain drain. Think about the loss of productivity. Think about the loss of, of progress that we've had just because for the last 80 years or so, we've been chasing um, Wall Street <laughs> Fugazi because, so, so our money doesn't disappear. Uh, it's just insane. And so if you think about, um, and, and I ask people a lot of times, I, I've, I've said uh, two of the greatest tricks the Fed ever played on us is one, Planet is telling us that our money has to increase uh, for the population to grow. And two, asset prices going up is a good thing. And I would say neither of those are true. And so, uh, and I would just ask people a question, would you rather your money buy you more goods and services in the future or less? And of course, everyone says more. And so if we could just work and be a brain surgeon and I could save my money and know that my money would buy me more goods and services in the future, um, then I could put all of my focus into whatever that is that I'm trying to do. And uh, man, imagine how much better that would be for humanity. Now, not good for Wall Street. So if you guys are in the financial industry, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe one day you'll be out of a job, but not for a while. But that, that'd be another big improvement for humanity, I think. Absolutely. Driving on that point, uh, a lot of people think that technology is neutral, right? I'm going to compare fiat money, Bitcoin, CBDCs um, through this lens. So people think technology is neutral, right? I have a hammer, I can build a house, or I can you know, use it as a weapon. Um, maybe the tech optimists, the Bill Gates type stereotype, they might say all technology is morally good because if the market adopts it, it gives us more choices, and that's obviously good. Maybe the Luddite says, no, technology is bad, destroys the family, destroys my religion, we should not have technology. Right? And I think all three of those sort of uh, angles on technology are wrong um, because technology is far more complex than that. And it's multivariable, and it matters who you're talking to. Right, so let's look at, um, at, before we go there, another way to look at this is technologies have a bias, right? What is the potential for abuse? Who is it good for? Who is it bad for? Right, central bank digital currencies, what's their bias? Um, their bias is that it consolidates power to a few. Um, it takes power away from the many, and the potential for abuse is very high. So I would rate that as a you know, pretty bad technology for everyone in this room. Um, looking at Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin is voluntary. Um, Bitcoin pushes, takes power from the central uh, planners and gives it to the individuals. Um, the individuals take risks, make businesses, create value. That helps everyone. So I think through that lens, Bitcoin's clearly a morally superior money. And as we go into this next fight of what's the next gold reserve currency, where do individuals store value, um, I think that morality aspect comes up. I think young people today look out and they see a future with very little hope. Um, they think the, the old people sold the future and, and gave the bill to the young people, and they're right in many ways. Um, but we can't have a society where young people have no hope. That does not work. 
no one produces families. Um, it's just not a good situation. And so enter Bitcoin, uh, what I would say is a morally superior money. I would say it provides hope for individuals looking to the future. And I was also say, going back to my uh, notion on symbiosis with humans, the technology is going to change us. Okay, Bitcoin's going to change us in many ways. How? Um, it's a hard, hard question to ask on a society level because adoption is so small. But what we can do is look at individuals, right? Um, holding a deflationary asset um, that over time continues to increase in value, that teaches you to think longer term, um, lowers your time preference. Why is that good? Um, humans are at their best when we think long term, right? That savings, that ability uh, to preserve your wealth in the short term means that you are insulated from risk. Um, that may come in the future. That makes you feel safe. That allows you to plan long term. And that accumulated capital allows you to create, uh, take a bigger risk and create a bigger reward. And so that is a better situation. So deflationary money teaches us to think long term. That scales to, to society. Um, the next thing is to actually own physical Bitcoin, you have to take the private keys into your possession. That forces you to accept personal responsibility. Um, in a society today where personal responsibility is appearing to be at an all-time low, at least in my lifetime, I think having more personal responsibility pushed onto the people is a good thing. Um, reduce reliance on state and put the, put the power back in the individual. And more agency individual is good for everyone. Um, and so, yeah, back to you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I mean, like I said, a technological revolution, uh, as we've seen five in the past uh, couple hundred years, and here we're uh, witnessing the sixth. Um, changes the course of humanity. So these are all the ways that we think it can change the course of humanity. Um, where do these lead? We don't really know, right? We, do, we can't imagine the future. What I do know is that when you solve the problem of a million people, you probably make a million bucks. When you solve the problem of a billion people, you probably make a, mil a billion bucks. And what I might imagine is that the oldest problem that mankind has had from the beginning of time is how do I secure my property from being stolen. So Brandon might want to come take my chickens. And so me and somebody else, you know, make a little group and then we make a village and then we make a tribe and then we make a kingdom and we make a country and we're always trying to secure our private property. And what happens when you fix that problem? What happens when now Bitcoin and I can secure all my property with a cryptographic key I can keep in my head? It doesn't require an army or a country to secure that. So when you solve the biggest and the oldest problem mankind has suffered, what does that mean for the future? And we just don't have the answer for that, but it's big. It's bigger than any of you can imagine. So one, change the course of humanity. Two, drives financial markets. And so think about that. There's a lot of opportunities, um, obviously, with Bitcoin, and you can all buy and hold it. And of course, you all should. Uh, you're all here for a swan event, so I'm sure you are. You should buy more. But there's also lots of opportunities around that, right? It's going to create all types of opportunities through all types of markets, and there's all types of... Like we just heard about video games I and mean, there's all types of other opportunities popping up, ancillary services, education services, products that are going to be popping up around this. I mean, it's going to create entire industries around it, uh, I think. And that's what history kind of shows us. Um, maybe just uh, maybe a last couple points, if, if we have a few more minutes um, to kind of talk back on the technology side. A couple things that I think that we also see as we look at these technology cycles is they also kind of follow these uh, same type of trends. And so what we'll see, for example, in the automobile boom is um, as soon as this new technology came out, uh, the speculators rush in. And of course, money drives incentives. And so the speculators rush in, they want to get rich, they want to cash in on this technology. And all of a sudden, there's 250 automobile manufacturers, but there was no markets, no one to buy them, and there's no services for those, and they all went out of business. Um, and we saw the same thing in the internet days with the web van and the, dot, and the pets.com and all those things. And I think we've also seen a similar thing happen in the uh, you know, Bitcoin slash crypto space as well, where the financial speculators have come in and they've tried to do the exact same thing that we've seen in the last same technology cycles, but they had the exact same problems. One, there was no market. There's not enough people for all these 22,000 whatever ideas that they have. And two, there's just the infrastructure is just not there for that. And then, you know, most of them are stupid anyway. Uh, <laughs> we'll come back to that. But I think what they're trying to do also mimics some other things that we've seen in the past where um, there's different competing platforms in the beginning, you know, the beta, the beta versus uh, VHS kind of thing, right? And you see these different platforms kind of playing out. Uh, it's a new technology. You don't know what it is. Uh, and, and I might have been guilty of making that same argument in 2017 or 2018. I think at this point it's pretty clear, right? And I think the technological revolution is decentralization. It solved the digital ledger, right? Decentralized. And, 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 and you can't be 
better than that. Uh, Vitalik Buterin laid it out on his own uh, trilemma, as he calls it. Um, and he's the one that laid it out. And so since you can't be more decentralized, then you have to be less decentralized and better at something else. But the revolution is decentralization. And so it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't uh, serve any purpose trying to do that. And so what, what I see happening is, and this uh, idea that kind of Corey had kind of brought up when we're looking at this, uh, these, these revolutions, and really the kind of the first few were like transportation. How do we move things better? How do we move ourselves, uh, move objects, build bigger objects, stronger objects? But now we're in this information age. And again, and that was this problem that we had that Bitcoin has solved. And so now we're like moving information. And of course, the internet helped us do that. But now how do we move things of real value? And how do we move things of value in the information age, the digital age, without them being duplicated? And so that's what it solved, and that's a, and that's a really big problem. And so when I think about it like that, um, just like the internet has one base protocol, and then there's protocols built on top of it, and it stacks up in layers, and there's trillions of applications that are built on one single protocol. And that doesn't make me a TCP IP maximus. I mean, maybe it does. I guess maybe I am. Uh, but I don't think anybody uh, thinks that we need to have a whole bunch of those internets. We just need one. Well, actually, in the mid-90s, a lot of people think we thought we did. And so a lot of these Fortune 500 companies said, we can't trust our data on this big open internet. We need a private intranet. And we're going to spend billions and billions of dollars on private intranets that are all gone today. And so I think um, if you understand kind of the way technology unfolds, I encourage you, each of you to go dig into this a little bit more if you're, if you're interested in it. But I think the way this unfolds is that we see um, one protocol, all of these applications get built on this one protocol, um, and it just takes time. But I think it, it's a predictable pattern that we'll see repeat again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I take a little bit of offense to the TCPIP maximalists. So I went to the University of Minnesota, the Golden Gophers. Um, and in the 90s, maybe even the 80s, I barely know the story, uh, there was a gopher protocol which was competitive to TCP IP. And yeah. I'm, I'm still waiting for the resurgence. Um, not so likely. <laughs> <laughs> well, different applications have to battle it out in the beginning, right? And then some win and some lose. That's right. And one, one further point on like what, what's the value of Bitcoin? People think it's um, 21 million. People think it's permissionless. People think all these different reasons, all valuable reasons. Um, I actually think the most important thing about Bitcoin is that humans can't change it. Um, it like TCP IP, there's no way we're changing that because it's too embedded. I think that's the secret of Bitcoin. Um, all previous monies in the history of time uh, failed either due to a competitor out competing that money or corruption from the inside. So we own the mint and times are tough. So we clip your coins, um, that greed cascades and then you break the money. And I think Bitcoin solves for both of these two problems why currencies change. One, the technological advancement. Bitcoin can evolve technologically. Base layer does what it does best. It's dumb money, it's secure, it's settlement. And we can have infinity layers on top and infinity layers on the side. So we can adapt this monetary network to the needs of our species. Um, and the second one is, um, can it be corrupted? And I think that's still yet to be seen, but I think it's clearly the, the biggest contender in a money that will never be corrupted. Hasn't been yet. It's passed a few trials and tribulations, but maybe we haven't fought the final boss yet. But I think it, it is the money that has a chance. Um, all these other competitors, Ethereum, whatever, um, they don't they don't have that aspect. In which case, there may be a 30-year system at absolute best until it gets corrupted. Um, where Bitcoin, it has the potential to be a 500-year system, 5,000-year uh, system. It might be the first immortal money because it can learn, it gets smarter. We 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 shepherd it through. Um, but no one can pervert it. No one can corrupt it politically. And that that's the most important part here because that allows society to build on top of this new robust layer that can't be changed. And all the political do-gooders, the central planner types, the, the ladder climbers who want to grab, grab the money, um, they make a calculation in their head, consciously or otherwise. They say, well, how do I get more power? I can build a company. Well, that's hard. What if I just co-opt the money? What if I just play politics? What if I just buddy up to the, the monetary system? That's way easier. And so some of the best and brightest pursue that path because it is a higher EV. Um, but in a system where it's acknowledged that the money cannot be captured, you, can't, you will not have brain power and human capital trying to capture the money because it's impossible. So those people either become uh, normal people again or they have to pursue their ambition in a, in a more productive way, which might mean build a company. And so not only will it last longer, which gives us stability and the ability to uh, build more, but it, it uh, unlocks more human capital, 
and I think that's important. If any of you guys know who I am, you know I can just sit here and talk all night, so we'll try and wrap it up here. <laughs> um, I don't know how much longer we have. I, I, might, I might wrap it up with kind of one last little rant here. Um, and uh, I, what, what I'd say is, is, is um, as I kind of said earlier, that problems, or I should say solutions, are supposed to come to problems. And it's pretty evident if you look around the world today, we have a lot of big problems. And the problems have been, they're not new, but they're getting bigger and, and they're getting worse. And some of the problems I think about would be like, um, we used to have a rule of law, right? And the constitution was a rule of law. And uh, it was supposed to be open and known to everybody so I could direct my lives based off of those rules and you could direct your life based off those rules. But today we don't have that anymore. We're ruled by men who arbitrarily change rules. That's a problem for me. Um, we used to have um, you know, freedom to move, uh, to exchange words, to exchange values, and a lot of that has been taken away. And that's a big problem for me. Um, we're being censored you know, on what we say. We're being censored on our transactions. PayPal can now dock you 2,500 bucks. Um, that came back, by the way. Um, and so, so those are big problems. So we need a big solution for those problems. And I'm not the one, that, one of the guys who's gonna cry on big problems, because big problems mean big opportunities. And we got a big, we got a big solution here. And so um, the solution came, and it, instead, of, instead of being censored, it gave us something that's now censorship resistant. And instead of um, something that's arbitrarily controlled and ruled by men, we have something that is trustless and it's not controlled by men. Now, of course, you can have Ethereum if you want something controlled by men, but Bitcoin is controlled not by men. And so we have that solution today. And so I think it's important to understand, though, that the battle lines are here. The battle lines are drawn and, and it's coming to a head here pretty quickly. And so I kind of work with this sense of urgency. And so like Bitcoin is a big tool um, that can give us hope. As Brandon said, that some tools are better than others. Um, but on one side, they want more control. And on the other side, I think the side that most of us are on, we want more freedom. We want them to have less control. Uh, there was an article recently that talked about the Treasury, the US Treasury as this all seeing eye of Sauron where really all of these KYC and AML and FinCEN, all these things, they're not just regulations to stop terrorism. They want to see every single transaction because they want 100% in total control. And the reason why they want 100% in total control is because if they control the money, they control the world, right? Control the food, control the people, control the energy, control the continent, control the money, control the world. They need 100% visibility and control to every single financial transaction that happens in the world. Never mind giving, you know, leaving billions of dollars for the Taliban. You're 600 bucks. That's a problem, right? We need to see that. And so this is coming to a head. Like this is coming really quickly. The social credit score system is, is moving fast and CBDCs are on the rise and they're coming and they're coming fast and they're, it's happening in other countries first. I think the US, I have a little bit of hope. I think we're still gonna have a battleground here in the US because of the constitution, that pesky doc document. It doesn't allow the Fed to create money. We'll see how that shakes out. But this is coming to a head and it's coming to a head most likely in the next couple of years. And we're either gonna win and we'll have our freedom money and hopefully we'll start to chip away and def defund the big state, we'll call it that. Or they win and we all have CBDCs and we can live our life in permanent slaves. And so I think it's, it's pretty important. And I think we should all try to be a little bit more involved. And so I challenge you a little bit on that. But at a minimum, just buying Bitcoin, at least you're doing something. At least you're doing something and start there. So uh, it's something much bigger than what we understand, what we will know. Um, our grandkids will look back and think, wow, I can't believe these guys, these pioneers. Uh, you're all part of something really, really big and something super, super important. So just buying and holding it, you're doing your part. And if you can, try to dig in and do a little bit more. Thank you. So the price of Bitcoin goes up. Sell button. No sell button.